For over 50 years, the Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College has hosted preeminent scientists, theologians, and ethicists to discuss questions at the intersection of science and society. From the newest results in physics, chemistry, and biology to the newest fields of multidisciplinary study, scientists at the Nobel Conference have examined the universe at its largest and smallest scales, explored the oceans, described new materials, and investigated human and animal behavior. Conference speakers have debated the mechanisms of aging as well as the science and economics of food. Often speakers have given us a glimpse of the next defining questions and how they might be answered. Throughout all of the conversations, ethicists and theologians have grounded the science in a human dimension. This year's conference focuses on addiction, a uniquely human condition. The 51st Nobel Conference, Addiction, Exploring the Science and Experience of an Equal Opportunity Condition, brings together experts in medicine, neuroscience, sociology, and philosophy to explore the science and experience of addiction. The conference explores a range of questions. What does it mean to be addicted? Is it a brain condition? A psychological disorder? A sociological problem? The answers to these questions raise a very important one. What treatment options are available? We hope you enjoy this year's presentation by Carl Hart entitled, Why Drug-Related Research is Biased, Who Benefits, Who Pays? Carl Hart is Associate Professor of Psychology in both the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology at Columbia University and Director of the Residential Studies and Methamphetamine Research Laboratories at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. As a neuropsychopharmacologist and social activist, he is known for his research in drug abuse and drug addiction. A major focus of Dr. Hart's research is to understand complex interactions between drugs of abuse and the neurobiology and environmental factors that mediate human behavior and physiology. Dr. Hart is author of the book High Price and co-author of the textbook Drugs, Society, and Human Behavior. Thank you, Kayla. That was, that was a great introduction. I actually have to bring you with me for my next couple of talks, so thank you very much. Um, I also, I want to thank the president, Pre President Bergman. Thank you so much uh, for hosting this event, for inviting me, Scott Burr. Thank you all for inviting me. Um, Scott and I came up with the title of my talk. Um, I, 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 it's uh, why drug-related research is biased. Um, I'll talk about that somewhat, but it could be titled a number of things. Music is still running in the background. For my okay, yeah. thank you. So just a heads up if you want to hit oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I was just told that I, I had music playing from my computer. Um, wanna, <laughs> that's what I do. You know, I, I, I usually have my own music. But you had a band, and so I wasn't, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't aware that you had a band, so I brought my own music, but, uh, but now that that's been settled, um, I, I have to also uh, shout to the people who are in their dorm rooms watching this via a, a live stream. I understand that the university, the college allows you all to watch this in your underwear, so. <laughs> It's the only way to hear a talk by me in your underwear. Um, I, I, I need to thank I need to thank the people, my host. Uh, you heard from one Kayla. That was so such a kind introduction. And I also have to thank Caroline David. She was the person who picked me up from the airport, and she um, uh, she was so accommodating. Um, and I have a sick sense of humor. I, I wanted to mess with her, but I didn't. I was going to tell her to take me to the spot so I could buy some illegal drugs, and she would have. She would have because she's so accommodating. But. <laughs> But I didn't want to mess with her too much. Um, so when you do these kind of talks, I, I, I have to say that my, when you do these kind of talks, these public talks, and the house is packed, uh, I understand we're in a gym. And um, where else would you give a talk like this? Um, it's, it's a great atmosphere. There's a lot of people. And you have heard several talks. And sometimes um, we as scientists, we can be boring. And um, I know I listened to some, some talks throughout my career. So our job 
as speakers are to be engaging and informative at the same time. And when you do that, sometimes the nuance is lost. And so much of what I say will be, it's in the book with all the details and the nuance. And it's also in the papers that I will cite. So I just want to give that disclaimer. Um, and I also want to say that when you give this kind of talk to a talk related to drug use, I won't talk much about addiction and I'll tell you why. Uh, I have a problem with the, the sort of focus on addiction and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. When you give this kind of talk, a talk that challenges the status quo, and you don't challenge the status quo for the sake of doing it, you challenge it because there are some serious consequences for what is currently being done. So when you give this kind of talk, you have to make sure that you are not too strident or too rigid. I am open, and so I will try not to be strident. Uh, but please do not mistake my passion for being strident and closed. Okay? Now, let's get to the business of giving the talk. And before doing that, I have to start with a quote from my favorite author, James Baldwin. Baldwin said, and this is how I now live my life, Bob. Baldwin said, the paradox of education is precisely this. That is one uh, uh, begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. This happened to me. And I want to share with you today some of the education in which I acquired along the way. And I want to make three major points. And I'll make these points throughout the talk. The first thing, or one of the major things that happened to me along my education, my drug education, my drug addiction education, my education trying to understand the neurobiological mechanisms that were responsible for drug addiction, one of the first things that I learned was that drugs are not the problem. I know when you come to a conference like this, you are sometimes hoodwinked into, into believing that drugs are not the problem, uh, drugs are the problem. They are not the problem. Particularly when you consider this fact. The vast majority of drug users don't have a problem, 80 to 90% of them. And this isn't something that's new or remarkable. We know this in science. But many people talk about these drugs from marijuana to heroin to cocaine to uh, Molly or MDMA as if the majority of the users have a problem. They don't. The majority of drug users, including heroin users, including cocaine users, the majority of the users are responsible members of our society. They take care of their families. They handle their responsibilities. And in some cases, they even become the president of the United States. <laughs> You all know that the last three presidents of the United States all acknowledged illegal drug use. Bill Clinton, marijuana, George Bush, marijuana, and widely suspected of using cocaine. Barack Obama, cocaine as well as marijuana. Now the goal here, or the point here, is not to tarnish or besmirch the reputation of these three men. They managed to do that on their own. Uh, <laughs> my point is simple. My point is that their drug use did not result into this inevitable downward spiral into debauchery and addiction. My point is that these guys are the rule, not the exception. And another point is that most of the people who use drugs don't need jail. But one of the things has, that has become more popular to say surrounding this discussion, particularly now in the era of mass incarceration, you can get liberals and conservatives agreeing now 
that most of the people who use drugs don't need jail, but they need treatment. Eric Kandel yesterday let us all know that we can now curse at this conference. <laughs> Eric's a colleague at Columbia. I love Eric, right? So thank you, Eric, for saying that. And, it, and, and, and his swear word yesterday is quite appropriate here. When we start to say that we would rather people go to treatment, or when we say that people who use drugs need treatment instead of drugs, I mean, need treatment instead of jail, Eric's comment is right on. That's bullshit. Most of the people who use drugs don't need either. They need to be treated humanely. They need to be educated about how to use drugs. Just like we educate people in a variety, on, about a variety of behaviors that are potentially dangerous. When we think about sex, we think about driving automobiles, both of those activities can be fun, and, but potentially dangerous. And so when we think about what we've done in terms of drugs, we have missed all kinds of opportunity to educate people about drugs, basic information. Now, we have a lot of high school students in the house, a lot of young people in the house. And I, I, I just wanna, I wanna take one, I wanna just uh, use one example of, related to marijuana or THC here. Um, to help educate people about, uh, particularly the young people, uh, uh, about marijuana or, or THC. But before doing so, I want to show you a short clip. It's just a, a, a 30 second clip. Um, and then I'll come back with the education. So, sound people, I want to make sure I have my sound. This is a clip, I need some sound. Here we are. A councilman from Dearborn, Michigan is outraged over a 911 call. He wants to know why no charges have been filed against a police officer who admits to confiscating marijuana from suspects and then baking it in brownies. But once he and his wife were full and high, they thought they'd overdosed and called 911. I think I'm having an overdose as well as my wife. Overdose of what? Marijuana. I don't know if it had something in it. Can you please send rescue? Did you guys have fever or anything? No, I'm just, I think we're dying. Oh, okay, how much did you guys have? I, I don't know, we made brownies, and I think we're dead. Time is going by really, 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 really slow. <laughs> well, instead of being charged, Prilla. <laughs> Instead of being charged, the police department let the officer resign. His wife was not charged either. So far, police officials have not commented on the case. Now, how do you follow a story like that? We'll talk about... Just a brief, just a brief educational point here. An opportunity to teach people about marijuana, about potentially harmful effects of marijuana. The poor police officer and his wife they ate the marijuana, right? And so we can teach people here, this is an opportunity to teach people about route of administration. They were expecting the effects of marijuana to be more immediate. That's what happens when you smoke a drug. The effects are more immediate. Effects of marijuana, the peak effects when you smoke it are felt within five minutes or so. Whereas when you take it orally, the peak effects are not felt for maybe an hour and a half later, until an hour and a half later. And so that means, young people, that means if you don't feel the effect after 15 minutes, don't put more in your gut. <laughs> if you don't feel the effects after 30 minutes, don't put more in your stomach. If you don't feel the effects after an hour, don't put more in your stomach. That would decrease the likelihood of you putting all of this THC in your system and then you can't control the effects. And then you have, you'll be on TV. Uh, <laughs> there was a recent article, maybe an op-ed written in the New York Times maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago by Maureen Dial. She is an oppo, an opinion writer. She went to Colorado bought some marijuana, because mar marijuana is legal in Colorado, bought uh, a candy bar laced with THC and ate the entire candy bar. And she had 
limited or no marijuana experience. Stupid. <laughs> That's not smart. But she wrote about this as if, as to warn us, the public, about the dangers of marijuana. It would be like me going out and buying a fifth of vodka I rarely drink and drinking it all and then writing about it and telling you about the dangers of alcohol. But the public accepted this as if this was real information. So the point here is to make sure that we transfer real information that keeps people safe. In this case, if you're going to use oral THC, start off slow, particularly if you're a novice, and don't continuously put more in your gut. Simple message. Another point I'd like to make. A councilman from Dearborn. Oops, not again. Another point. <laughs> another point I'd like to make. I'd like to make, this, this is one of the things that I learned along the way. We as a society have exaggerated the harmful effects of drugs. And we have in part because the frame has been constantly on drug addiction and drug abuse, which represents a small percentage of drug use and the people who use drugs. And so as a result, we have exaggerated the harmful effects of drugs. Here's another quick clip of how we are currently educating people about methamphetamine. This isn't normal. But on meth, it is. Almost none of that represents methamphetamine use in reality. Now, methamphetamine is one of the areas in which I have published uh, quite a bit in. And when I say I publish quite a bit uh, with methamphetamine, I should tell you something about what I do. And one of the things that we do with our research is we bring people into the lab and we give them drugs and we measure the effects of these drugs on a wide range of behavioral measures, of cognitive measures, of neurological measures, uh, a wide range of me measures. Um, and as a result of this, we learn quite a bit about what drugs do and what drugs don't do. And one of those drugs that I've studied quite a bit is methamphetamine. And I want to quickly just show you some of the data about methamphetamine because that last clip suggested that when people smoke methamphetamine, they are so intoxicated that they can't respond to emergencies in an appropriate manner. That's one thing. And another thing is that when you smoke methamphetamine, you're likely to have that type of overdose. I don't even know what those symptoms were. I don't know what that was. But those were the sort of messages that they wanted us to get from this. And so I'll just kind of share with you all just quickly some of the research that we've done. Now, I understand that when you present research data to an audience, it's hard for you, the audience, to follow quickly. Uh, as quickly as I will go through these slides. But I also am putting the sort of references up here so you can go and you can get the references and you can carefully go through the papers yourself. But the point here is just to give you an idea. Uh, sometimes when I am at scientific talks and the speakers are speaking and they're presenting their data, it feels like subjugation, like I, they, they want me, like, I feel like I'm a prisoner of their rhetoric or whatever. And so I don't want you to feel like that from what I'm saying. This is just a simple paper that one of my, at the time, graduate students, he's now a, a doctor, uh, uh, did for as part of his dissertation. And I just want to just show you some of the effects on cognition, on some simple cognitive tasks. Um, if you focus your attention here on the black bar, that's placebo. In the, the blue bar, that's 20 milligrams oral methamphetamine. The red bar is 40 milligrams oral methamphetamine. This is a simple test that measures sustained attention. More hits means improvement on the task. 
More misses means a decline, or less misses mean improvement on the task. What you can see here simply, and these research participants in this study were not addicted, they had limited uh, use histories with methamphetamine. So these are folks who were not, not addicts, they're just regular people who had some experience with methamphetamine. What you can see here quickly is that methamphetamine improves cognitive performance on this simple task. And there were other tasks you see similar sort of findings. In another study conducted by, or the lead person was an undergraduate student in my lab, she was interested in the effects of methamphetamine on speech, as well as MDMA on speech. But I'm only going to show you the methamphetamine data. She was interested in speech because she had heard that when people take stimulus like methamphetamine, they, their speech speeds up to the point where you can't understand them. So one of the things that we did in this study, these folks lived with us for about three weeks or so, uh, and every night they watched a videotape movie. Uh, and, and every day they got a dose of drug, whether it's placebo, methamphetamine, or MDMA. But I'm only going to show the methamphetamine data. Now, what we did was we told the participants, we would ask them to summarize the film that they saw the evening before. And there, there were four people living in the lab at the same time. And the best summary for each day would get an additional $50. But they had to summarize the film when they were on drug. Of course, they didn't know what drug. They, it could have been placebo. Uh, or it could have been an active drug. So, of course, uh, that was actually some deception. We paid everyone an additional $50 each day just for providing a summary. But we told them that they would be in competitions with the other three participants. And then we recorded their speech. And we recorded their speech to measure the amount of disfluencies. That is, pauses, um, when people said like, uh, or, or other sort of uh, speech sort of uh, disruptions. We measured uh, the dis dis disfluencies. That was one part of the test, but we recorded these tests or these uh, summaries. And then we had 100 undergraduate students from Columbia rate the speeches for coherence. So one part was objective measures, another part was subjective measures. When you look at disfluencies, when they took the larger dose of methamphetamine, 40 milligrams, what you saw was that methamphetamine improved speech by decreasing the number of influencies. It also improved speech on other measures. And the undergraduates rated the people who were taking methamphetamine as being more coherent. Now, I should tell you, the dose, these doses of methamphetamine produce nice ratings of euphoria. We are in the range, the euphoric range here. And then here's just a summary of some of the other studies that have looked at methamphetamine at doses larger than 20 milligrams and looked at cognitive performance. And what you see across uh, various types of routes of administration from oral to intranasal to intravenous, one of the things that you, what you see clearly is that methamphetamine improved cognitive performance. We didn't see any disruptions across these tasks, across these studies. This is not surprising. Our military, and uh, well, I should say, methamphetamine is currently approved, FDA approved, as a treatment for ADHD or attention deficit disorder as well as obesity. So this is not surprising, methamphetamine is a stimulant. But one of the things that might be somewhat surprising to some people is that some people think that methamphetamine is unique, it's a unique amphetamine. So it's not like d which is the active compound in Adderall, and we're on a college campus, so I know most people know what Adderall is. Adderall, of course, is uh, an ADHD treatment, uh, approved uh, ADHD treatment, as well as for narcolepsy and so forth. Uh, uh, a number of people are taking Adderall. So one of the questions that we were interested in 
Because people sit t tend to think that methamphetamine is unique, that it's somehow different from amphetamine, we were interested in, well, why is it unique? What makes it unique? And one clue is this methyl group that's on methamphetamine here. This is the only difference between the two compounds, the methyl group. Some people have said that this methyl group increases the lipid solubility of methamphetamine. That is, enhances its ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, therefore making it more potent, more addictive, more dangerous. You add the adjective. Whatever awful adjective you want to put, that's what people say. Now, this seems to be in conflict from what we know from the human literature. If you go back to 1971, the first study that compared the effects of deamphetamine with methamphetamine under double-blind conditions in the same people, that study was conducted by Billy Martin and his crew. What they found was that the drug produced identical effects on heart rate, blood pressure, subjective effects measures. And then you fast forward up until 1994, Jack Heningfield and Rick Lamb did a study that extended those findings. By the way, this is oral methamphetamine, oral deamphetamine. They extended the findings of Billy Martin, and then Craig Rush and his group in 2009 extended the findings of both of those uh, other uh, groups of researchers. So when the drug was given orally, they produced identical effects. That is, methamphetamine and deamphetamine, Adderall, are the same drug. They produce the same effects in humans. Well, some people say, well, that's, under, that's when you give the drug orally. And that's when you give relatively modest doses. I think the largest dose that any of those studies had previously given was something like 30 milligrams. What happens when you give the drug via route that's, it's associate, that's associated with abuse? So we were interested in that question. As part of his dissertation, Matt Kirkpatrick, one of my former students, was interested in that question. So we designed a study where we gave intranasal methamphetamine up to 50 milligrams in people, and we tested it with deamphetamine to see whether or not we would replicate the earlier studies. So here are those data. Let me orient you to this slide quickly. Black is placebo, light green is low dose of deamphetamine, dark green is low dose of methamphetamine, Light red is low dose, I mean, sorry, high dose of amphetamine. Dark red is high dose of methamphetamine. This is a measure of systolic blood pressure. The comparisons are between the reds and the greens, and of course, placebo. If you look at this slide, you can see that methamphetamine and deamphetamine produce the same effect on systolic blood pressure. The same is true with diastolic blood pressure. The same is true with heart rate. The same is true with body temperature. Then you look at subjective effects, similar sort of things happen with high, with good drug effect, with stimulated, other subjective effects measures. They produce the same effect. In our lab, we also like to give people an opportunity to actually take the drug. And when we do this, we usually um, provide them a choice of drug compared to some, or, or along with something like a monetary value, like $5 in this case. When you look at the data, of when, when participants would, were given an opportunity to choose to take the drugs, how did they fare? Well, the drugs produce the same effects. So methamphetamine and deamphetamine produce the same effect across all of these measures, physiological measures, behavioral measures, even cognitive measures, the same effect. They are the same drug. So the notion that methamphetamine is somehow unique or somehow a different drug, it's just simply not supported by the weight of the evidence. Okay. Another sort of thing that um, people have been concerned with when it comes to methamphetamine, those data that I showed you were in response to uh, acute administration of methamphetamine. What about this issue related to people who have been using the drug for many years, and then you look at their brains, or then you test their cognitive performance? What's going on in those people?
Those are the people we, we are really concerned about. We certainly are concerned about them. I, I, I have a picture here, a brain imaging picture. This is a picture, uh, if you focus your attention, this is a pet imaging picture. Um, I'll tell you about what that is in a second. But if you focus your attention on the left, that's the, that's the brain image of someone who's never used methamphetamine. But if you focus your attention on the right, that's someone who, had, this is someone who's used methamphetamine for a number of years. Uh, someone we might uh, uh, classify as methamphetamine uh, use, dis use uh, disorder person or addiction uh, for the colloquial sort of term. Now, a pet image, what, what happens with pet imaging? With pet imaging in something like this, we inject into the person a radioactive compound, isotope, that selectively binds to dopamine transporters, receptors, or some dopamine molecule. Now, what, in this binding of this chemical to these dopamine molecules, when it binds, it emits a signal that can light up. Like, this is what we're seeing, these colors, this lighting up. So, lower amounts of, of binding is an indirect way of thinking about maybe there are some dopamine cells that were lost as a result of people's methamphetamine use. Now that was a huge leap, and so I just want to make sure you all understand that's a huge leap. But we make that leap because when you look at the animal literature, if you give large doses of methamphetamine or any amphetamine, to an animal, large doses, and then you kill the animal and you measure or you look at the dopamine uh, cells and, or you see what, what happened with the dopamine cells. The dopamine cells are selectively destroyed, well, as well as other monoamine cells like serotonin, norepinephrine, they are destroyed. So we have extrapolated that this might happen in humans. But when we talk about these data, we oftentimes leave out some important steps that happen in the animal lab. For example, I said that you have to give large doses of the drug to the animal, who, to a naive animal. Now, if you give escalating doses to that animal, such that that animal is no longer naive, and then you give the whopping large dose, you don't see the neurotoxicity that I described previously. So the animal developed tolerance, and then you don't see the neurotoxicity. And also the doses are 10, 20, 30, 40 times the doses that a human would take. So those steps are kind of sometimes glossed over. They're not really talked about when we start talking about the neuroimaging or the rationale for, for our beliefs. But put that skepticism on hold for a second. I, I, I just want to show you, I just want to make the point that oftentimes when people only show you neural imaging data, when they only show you these neural imaging data, part of the goal, their goal is to pull the wool over your eyes. So uh, th this is not data, this is a picture. This, these are data. Now these are the kind of data that you would get that would, would make up that image. Uh, let me just orient you to the slide. This is binding of a monoamine transporter. Uh, in, the, in the circles you have the control group, people never use methamphetamine. In the triangles you have the methamphetamine users. And this is an area in the midbrain of the brain, uh, uh, dop a dopamine rich area. What you can see clearly is that the methamphetamine users have a lower binding potential in general compared with the control. It's about a 10 to 20% difference. What you also can see is that there is tremendous amounts of overlap between the groups. That is, some people in the methamphetamine, u in the methamphetamine using group look like some people in the control group and vice versa quite a tremendous amount of, of, of overlap. Another thing about this kind of data, or this type of work that you should be aware of, is that we don't know what was there before they started using methamphetamine. So we're all on the same page. And what, what's, what's also critically important is that 
whenever we are doing this type of work, um, particularly if we're trying to make statements about deficits, brain damage, impairments, all of these sorts of things, whenever we're trying to make these clinically functional statements, we must always compare the performance or the biological marker with a normative database adjusting for age and education. We think about cognitive testing. You can't make conclusions about impairments if you don't make a comparison first with this normative database, adjusting for age and education. So your control group, if you have a control group, that is insufficient, even if you have a statistically significant difference between your group. A control group alone is insufficient to make comments about impairments, about deficits, about damage, without making some comparison to this, um, normat to this normative database. So that's critically important. And so one of the things that I have become troubled by in reading the methamphetamine literature is that researchers or the literature is replete with statements about impairments, about damage, about deficits, without making a comparison to a normative database. And so one of the things that I thought I'd do was systematically review the literature and write a review. And that's what I did. I reviewed the neuroimaging papers and the cognitive functioning papers in this area to try and get some clarity on this issue. What I concluded was that the cognitive performance of the methamphetamine users is overwhelmingly normal when you do these appropriate corrections, when your research is rigorous. What I also concluded was that there was this propensity to interpret any brain differences or cognitive differences as being clinically significant abnormalities. And that's just not appropriate. The literature is replete with these inappropriate statements and it helps to give you a distorted view about what's happening with not only methamphetamine, you can find the same thing with marijuana. You can find the same thing with cocaine. In fact, I invite some of you smart students to do your own literature review and publish it. And you'll find the same sort of thing. So when I came across this sort of thing, it disturbed me. It, it made me question the role of the scientist, my role in exaggerating drug effects. And so when I question my role as a scientist, I have to think about who funds my work. I have to think about who funds other scientists' work. And the thing that you all should know is that the National Institute on Drug Abuse, our National Institute on Drug Abuse, which I am, by the way, an advisory council member, so that's my conflict of interest so you all know, but I'm here speaking on my behalf. I'm not speaking for anyone else. I don't even know their language. So I'm speaking on my own behalf. But you all should know that the National Institute of Drug Abuse funds 90% of the world's research in this area. They have a huge influence on what we think about drugs, which is, for us Americans, it's great that we can contribute so much to the world in this way. This is outstanding, actually. The American taxpayers is funding this. I'm happy for that. But one of the things that we should know is that what their mission is. Their mission is basically to focus on pathology, focus on drug abuse and drug addiction, the bad things that happens in response to drug use. Please recall when I said in my earlier slides that the vast majority of people who use these drugs don't have a problem. The overwhelming numbers of people who use these drugs don't have a problem. But 90% of the world's research in this area focuses on drug pathology. That means that we have a disproportionate focus on pathology. 
Now that coupled with this fact, scientists in general, we tend to err on the side of caution, and caution in this case means the bad things. And we err on the side of caution as if there are no consequences to that. And that would be fine to err on the side of caution there. That's absolutely fine. Particularly, we don't want people to think that we are encouraging folks to go out and use drugs. No one wants that. No one wants to be responsible for having some young person get in trouble with a drug or with anything. So I understand that. But we do this, or we have this disproportionate focus on caution or bad effects as if there are no consequences. When in fact, there are tremendous consequences. Because in reality, this sort of focus helps to shape or create an environment where certain drugs are deemed evil and any use of those drugs is considered pathological. And it also helps to create this environment where there's this unrealistic focus of eliminating drugs from our society at all costs. You all know this sort of drug-free society nonsense that we've been perpetuating in this country for so long. It's unrealistic. First of all, I, I should stop. Let me, let me slow down, stop. We should know that humans have always used drugs since they inhabited Earth. We should also know that humans will always use drugs. And you should know that you don't want to live in a drug-free society because it would be difficult to function, difficult to get through the day, difficult for me to get through some of the boring-ass receptions in which I have to attend. <laughs> but this sort of, this, this sort of focus this disproportionate focus on pathology. What does it mean? Well, it means a lot for influencing how we as a public think about drug effects. Just think about what gets published in the scientific literature. Overwhelmingly disproportionate, disproportionately negative pathological view of what drug use is about. Think about what's get published in the textbook. Think about what's get published in the popular press. Think about your, your awful movies that talk about drugs. Most of the movies that talk about drugs just get it wrong. Now, for me, the thing that disturbs me most is when we have this disproportionate focus on pathology, the thing that disturbs me most as a scientist is that it decreases our, the likelihood that we as a science will have a comprehensive understanding of drug effects. Not just the negative things, but all the drug effects. And it decreases our ability to educate young people honestly about how to stay safe. And we as a society should be upset about that. And we as a society should ask the question, well, why are we constantly being misled? Well, we're constantly being misled in part because it helps to increase the budgets of this thing I'm calling the addiction industry. And the addiction industry include the usual suspect, of course, law enforcement. We are all comfortable, comfortable talking about law enforcement and the war on drugs. We spend $26 billion a year in that effort. We're all comfortable talking about that. But we're less comfortable talking about the role of treatment providers in perpetuating this nonsense. We're all less comfortable in talking about the role of the scientists in perpetuating this nonsense. Politicians. Oh my God, politicians. The media. I mean, one of the things I try not to do, I try not to talk to politicians. It's becoming more and more difficult because I've been sought out by some. But politicians, I think Mark Twain has said it best when he said that politicians are like diapers. 
They, he said that um, they need to be changed often for the same reasons. <laughs> So, I, 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 so as I think about like why we're constantly being misled in this issue related to uh, the contingencies that are in place or the incentives uh, that are in place, I am reminded of the words of Upton Sinclair when he said, it is difficult to get a man, and in this case a woman too, to understand something when his or her salary depends upon his or her not understanding it. Another reason that we are constantly misled is that it helps us to avoid dealing with the problems that, the real problem that poor people face, the people on the margins of our society face. It's so much easier to say that we're going to rid our community of some drug and not deal with people's poor education and not deal with people's uh, unemployment and not deal with people's poor nutrition, health care, and all the rest of these things. It's so much easier to say we're going after methamphetamine, or right, right now in our country, we're saying we're going after heroin. All of those sorts of things are just fantastic distractions. And so it's so much easier to just focus on the distractions. And it also, it allows us to target the people that we don't really like without explicitly saying we don't like them. You know, it's not too cool in our society to say that we're going after Muslims because they're Muslim or their religion, whatever. But we can say we're going after some activity in which they're engaged. It's not too cool to say we're going after black people because we don't dig them. But we can say we're going after crack use, we're going after some other drug. All of this kind of helped me to understand my third and final point, the thing that I've been learning. It helped me to understand that our drug policy enforcement and enforcement has been racialized throughout our history. Now, I want to take us back and then we'll come forward. Just to go back to 1914. Let's go back to 1914, February 8th, 1914. The New York Times published this huge op-ed. Uh, now, I published an op-ed in the New York Times more recently, not 1914, but they didn't put my picture in there like they did the illustrious Dr. Williams here. Um, perhaps I need a title like Negro Cocaine Fiends Are a New Southern Menace. <laughs> so this was an article published in 1914. I just want to make three points, the three points that the author made. The author made three points. His points were that cocaine, when taken by black people, made them unaffected or imperious to 32 caliber weapon bullets. <laughs> now, that rationale was important because it helped the Southern police forces move away from the 32 caliber gun to the 38 caliber gun, so they could go after these people, these black folks, on cocaine. That's, that's one argument he was making. Another argument he made was that cocaine made them better marksmen, so they could shoot better when they're on cocaine. They were more accurate, more precise. And finally, he, his argument was that uh, cocaine also made them more murderous. So you got this, this deadly combination. Black people are more murderous, they shoot better, and they're unaffected by your bullets. <laughs> this article was persuasive, and these arguments were persuasive. They were arguments that were the primary fuel for getting the country to pass its first federal drug laws. 1914, we passed the Harrison Act. It was the first law, federal law, that restricted access to opiates and cocaine. We tried to pass this law in 1909, and Congress was like, no, it, but in 1909, it only included the opiates. 
because we were really concerned about the Chinese and, and the Congress said, nope, nope, they were in no mood. But when you added the cocaine and the black sort of story along with it, it pushed it over the top. And we all kind of have a good laugh about our history. But let's fast forward to 1986 or so when crack cocaine was a concern in the country. Similar arguments were, were made for crack cocaine. Of course, they were dressed up as something else, but we were concerned about black people in our urban centers smoking crack cocaine. We talked a little bit about this yesterday, so I'll just briefly. And that concern culminated in us passing the most restrictive drug laws at that time. We passed uh, the, infamous, the now infamous uh, cocaine laws that punished crack cocaine 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine. That is, people caught with small amounts of crack were required to go to jail for a minimum of five years. And to get the same sentence for powder cocaine, you would have needed to have 100 times more uh, amount of, of powder cocaine. Now, the result of this, the result of these laws were troubling, but it came to light in about 1994, 95, when the U.S. Sentencing Commission uh, did its major study and report, and what they found was that 80 percent, more than 80 percent of the people convicted under these laws were black, even though the majority of the crack users were not black. Uh, and then when they looked at specific places, places like L.A. County, for example, in 1992, L.A. County is quite diverse. Uh, not one white person was convicted of crack cocaine uh, violations in L.A. County, big diverse county. Uh, and so they looked at all of the data and they saw something, something terrible was going on. Um, now, as we think about what's happening even today with our drug laws, we think about our drug laws even today, I think this photo from Time Magazine, the cover of Time Magazine, is emblematic of what's happening even today with our drug laws. This is in Baltimore in 2015. Uh, Baltimore Police Force, and then you got this brother running. So this is how our drug laws are being enforced. Um, this is not my opinion. This is what um, uh, our uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder has said as a result of his, the evidence that he looks at. So this isn't my opinion um, uh, for some people who might be living under a rock or something. Um, now I want to go back, I want to go back to uh, crack cocaine and powder cocaine. I have to go back to crack cocaine and powder cocaine because some people don't understand how the two are the same drug. Uh, on this slide I have a picture of powder cocaine on the left and a picture of crack cocaine on the right. Go back to the left and look at the red circle. That's the only difference between the two. That red circle is a hydrochloride group. That's a salt, basically, and the only reason it's there is to keep the compound stable. That is, you can't smoke it. If you want to smoke it, you have to remove the salt, and that's what you do by adding baking salt or water, heating it up, letting it dry, and it comes back. Now the salt is removed, and now you can smoke it. Now, when we think about the effects, it's true that snorting cocaine versus smoking cocaine, crack cocaine. Snorting cocaine, the effects are not as intense and immediate as smoking crack cocaine. That is absolutely true. But when you dissolve your powder cocaine in water and shoot it in your vein, the intensity, the onset of the effects are identical to smoking crack cocaine. They are the same drugs. And we now know this, and we have known this for some time, and we tried to get that law changed for some time. Now, it was so frustrating that even presidential candidate Barack Obama weighed in on this law and how, what he thought was wrong with this law. This was in 2007 when he was speaking before a black audience at Howard University. He said, judges think that's wrong, Republicans think that's wrong, Democrats think that's wrong, and yet it's been approved by a Republican and Democratic president, uh, 
democratic presidents because no one has been willing to braid the politics and make it right. That will change when I'm president. Did that change? This was in 2007. Did that change? No, we got one for no. This is college. Come on, let's see some college participation. <laughs> Did it change? No. Say not no, but hell no. No. <laughs> well, it kind of changed. In, 2000, in 2010, the president signed into law this act that decreased the disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. It still makes no scientific sense. There is no other law for drugs that we punish one route of administration more harshly than another route of administration. Imagine if we punish people more harshly who are caught smoking marijuana than those who are caught having marijuana in their brownies. It wouldn't make any sense, and it doesn't make any sense here. I think Malcolm X had the best sort of words speaking to this issue. When he said, this was related to civil rights when he said it, but when he, th these words apply here, he said that if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there is no progress. The progress is in the healing. Those words have never been more true. And then when we consider this fact, even today, right now, the most recent evidence, most recent data that we have shows that even today, more than 80% of the people convicted under these laws today are still black, even though they don't represent the majority of the crack users. But this is not only with crack cocaine. This is with marijuana. In this state, Minnesota, I think nationwide, when we think about marijuana, black people are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana, even though they don't smoke it at rates higher than white folk. In the United States, they are four times more likely to be arrested. In the Twin Cities, in the cities as you all call them, in the cities, black people are about 11 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than white folks. So this is home, people. This is not, this is your country. This is going on today. And then when we think about the war on drugs and our beliefs about drugs and what that has meant in terms of the recent sort of killings of young black boys especially, and now Sandra Blaine and, 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 and um, Sarah uh, Cir Circle, Cir Circle Bear, a Native American woman, uh, also related to drugs, drug issue. We think about what's happening to folks in our pursuit of drugs. And we think about what do we do as a country when these things are going on. One of the things that the American Psychological Association has done or is trying to do, I'm a member of the American Psychological Association, one of the things that they tried to do is they tried to build resilience in black boys to kind of help them deal with the situation that's going on in our society today. This is ridiculous, actually. Building resilience in black boys when you have a fucked up society. Why are you building resilience in black boys and not dealing with your society? This is my concern that we get distracted into focusing on things that are not important. The things that are important is that we've been misled about the dangers of drugs and that has spiraled, that has spiraled into us trying to rid a society of drugs at all costs. And the costs are primarily being taken on by these folks, these young black boys and girls who are out here. So given those kind of statements that I have said, I should end, but I should leave you all with a few things that I think we should do, and then we should have a real heated discussion. <laughs> I 
So one of the things that we can do, since we are on a college campus, we have to put the work in. We have to actually know the science and be exceptional. We can't just regurgitate the same nonsense that has been passed on generation after generation. Know the science. If you actually know the science, you could actually help in the educational efforts of keeping young people safe. The facts are, young people are going to use drugs. That's a fact. Whether I like it or not, I have young children. But it's a fact. So the best thing we can do, that just like young people are going to have sex, at least we hope they are. <laughs> and the thing that we can do is give them the information to keep them safe, just like driving. They're going to drive. And when people start promulgating, perpetuating nonsense, please call out the misinformation. That's our role, our job as citizens in the country. And as we think about calling, the calling out the misinformation, that means you might have to call out the good guys, the people whose hearts are in the right place. They want to help folks. That's good. But your sincerity are not enough. You actually have to know something. <laughs> and we must do a better job of calling out racial discrimination, wherever it exists in our society. That means that you might have to check yourself. That means you may have to check the places that you work, the spaces in which you occupy. And I know this will be a little complicated for some people. You must get out of the closet about your own drug use. Now, now when I say this, I say this so we can change the narrative. I am not talking about people who say I had an addiction. I'm not talking about those people. They're already out of the closet. And there is a disproportionate focus on, their, on, on that group. And bless them, because it's like they need our help as well. But that story is an aberration. That's not the dominant narrative, but it has become the story that's supposedly the norm, it's not. But it's just not sexy for me to stand up here and say, you know, last night I got really intoxicated or, and it was nice, it's really nice. And then I came and I gave a lecture. <laughs> that's not as sexy as that. I hit rock bottom and I lost everything. And then I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, and now I'm a Republican. <laughs> and I am, I'm a firm believer that we have to change the legal status of our, the, what we're doing with drugs. Whether it's decriminal, decriminalizing drugs, that is not arresting anyone for drug possession, to, legal, to uh, legalize uh, regulated markets like what they've done in Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska uh, with marijuana, uh, it doesn't matter. My major point is that we stop arresting people for drugs. And we have to work to change the status for that. And when, whenever we change, anything, whenever we change a law policy, we must constantly evaluate the risk-benefit ratio or the cost-benefit ratio. We have to constantly evaluate it because we might have to tweak it here or tweak it there, but that's okay if we have to change things. And it's okay for us to make mistakes. That's okay, that's human. And it's also human to be cognitively flexible, that is change your course of action. One of the hallmarks of human intelligence is cognitive flexibility. This gives us an opportunity to show that we're intelligent. Now I must leave you with my final point being that this is not a formula for popularity. <laughs> if you seek to be popular, this ain't 
it. <laughs> but that's okay, because history will judge you right. And it's the right thing to do in, by your fellow citizens. Taking care of your fellow citizens is what we all should be doing more. And that's what this is about. And on that note, let's have a discussion.